Hello guys, good evening. I would like to start by introducing myself. I'm Marina, I'm a Brazilian law student. Uh, here at Cal, I'm a startup semester student under the Sutarja Center of Innovation and Technology, Entrepreneurship and Technology. Uh, tonight's guest was raised in Seattle, moved to California intending to study English and microbiology, dropped out twice to launch startups, eventually graduated in history of science and technology after eight years. He started five companies and failed uh, four of them. Uh, but had one golden ticket. Uh, he was co-founder and CEO of App Central, best known for its enterprise app storefront and management console. Uh, the company has uh, had a Series A funding for $4 million and was later acquired by Good Technology in October of 2012. Uh, nowadays, he's Managing Director of the Sutargent Center of Entrepreneurship and Technology here at Berkeley. He is Council of European Innovation Academy, founder and board member of the Applied Innovation Institute, great teacher and mentor, and he has also been to 16 different countries teaching entrepreneurship and technology. It's a pleasure to introduce Kent Singer. Thank you. So, I just go on stage then, right? Okay, there we go. <laughs> this side. Hey everyone, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Swetha. I'm a second year computer science student and one of the student coordinators for this year's Newton Lecture Series. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our second guest for today who will be joining Ken on stage. Stephen Lam is the CEO of GoGoVan. He grew up in Hong Kong and then moved to the US a little over a decade ago. He worked in Chinese restaurants, founded a bunch of smaller companies, and worked his way through school before ultimately graduating from the Haas School of Business in 2010. He later returned to Hong Kong and in 2013 founded the company that he would become most well known for, GoGoVan. Today, GoGoVan has over 350 employees and enjoys the distinction of being China's first billion dollar unicorn startup but he started from humble beginnings with less than $2,500 going into the initial capital of founding GoGoVan. I think we're in for a treat and certainly for a lot of wisdom and insights to have both of these two phenomenal individuals with us here today. So please, ladies and gentlemen, please join us in giving a very warm welcome to Stephen Lamb and Ken Singer. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. All right. So I had a bunch of I have a bunch of questions for you, and I want to pull them up on my Evernote. So okay. hold on one second. Maybe you can do a bit of an introduction well, so of what you I, want to talk well, about yeah, today. I'm, I'm, I'm Stephen. I still look like a student here, so with the t-shirt. Um, uh, I, I, <laughs> I grew up in Hong Kong. Hey, anyone from Hong Kong here? Go Hong Kong, all right? All right. So, so you, you know my coming, what, what, what we do, and I actually graduated from uh, Berkeley. Uh, I give you a quick background of m myself. I grew up in a uh, no-income family from Hong Kong. So if you heard of any like gangster movie like, like 12 years ago or like a decade or two ago, that some gangster movie from Hong Kong, I grew up in those districts. And my dad is like a construction worker. So I, I have a very humble background, but I made myself through school. And um, my English was extremely bad before I came to California in 2005. And there is a public exam like our SAT thing for between junior high school and senior high school. And then I have to take it like three times before I pass, pass it to, to, to the next level. So I was a very, very bad student. But I got a chance to, to come here to study. But I don't have a lot of money. I, 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 I literally have like 200 US uh, in, my, in my pocket by the time that I landed in California in 2005, October 19. And then I, I was living in a host family. The first thing that I did was find a restaurant, Chinese restaurant, of course, look at me. Uh, so Chinese restaurant to do whatever thing that you can think of in a Chinese restaurant, and then started to, to do some uh, business on the side. I helped people fix computers, bicycles, and then trade stuff on Craigslist. And then uh, at the end, I, 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 I saw a lot of first generation iPhone. I guess most of you haven't touched any one of those. It was 10 years ago. Uh, I was one of the largest iPhone, unlocked, jailbroken, first generation iPhone. On Wait, eBay. so let, let's go back. So okay. you, were trying to, you were trying to hustle yep. to stay in school by making money 
right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And so you're, you're running a few different kind of businesses, and one of, one, one of those was, hey, there are iPhones here in the US, yep. but they're not available in Hong Kong? Well, or they're expensive, or what was, how is it that well, you were? The, if you look online and find some news article, when the iPhone hit the market, everyone, every single one in the tech industry said Steve Jobs is out of his mind again. Who would use a phone without a keyboard? Everyone is on BlackBerry. Look at where is BlackBerry now, all right? Someone in San Francisco downtown, finance guys, okay, when you're hold, holding a BlackBerry, it's like, uh, this finance guy, all right? So in Hong Kong, when everyone looking at a BlackBerry guy, it's like, they don't get the girls talk to them in the bar anymore. You know, that's the, the, the thing. Uh, but at that time, California is the, I guess US is the first one, and with the California have the most stock in Apple Store for the first generation iPhone. Right, so, so it was all, mostly available here in America, yeah, for the first nine months, Nuts, one right. year. Right, yeah. and it was hard to find elsewhere. So you found an opportunity. Mm. Hey, I've got calls from friends who want an iPhone. You're living in California. Oh, no, I didn't get a call from friends, but all the, oh. everyone is still questioning about this. But because I, 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 did, I did a lot of business on eBay, I used to import a lot of like, like an automobile park from Alibaba and then sell it on like HID uh, head night thing, okay? So I did that, and then every day I just keep searching on eBay what to sell and stuff like that, gadgets. And then I find it, you know, I'm not sure eBay still does that, but on the search bar, there's a top searching keyword underneath the search bar. And then there was a period of time, iPhone was top searching keyword. I was like, why people keep searching on iPhone? And I clicked into it, and I found all the listing. It's like 3,000, 4,000 US with a uh, uh, beating and buy it now is like 450, uh, 4,000. Okay, so let's repeat that. So your journey was, hey, I'm selling, I'm hustling on eBay, I'm buying and selling, yep. arbitrage, trying to make money, margins here or there, yep. and you stumble across the yes. search bar and it gives you a piece of information that mm. says, people want this thing. This yep. keeps coming up as the top search. Yes. And then when you search it, you find out, that even though an iPhone might cost, what, how much was it at the time? Like $600 here, people are willing to buy it for three or $4,000? Yes. And who are these people? Well, these people are all this uh, pioneer, okay? The first mover, want to try their hand on the first ever gadgets. They may not like it, they just want to, yeah, I have it, it's cool. But where are these people? They, I mean, well, it, around the world. But oh. not in California, because they could get one for 600. Oh, Californian, if they want to buy it, they will, all, they, they will go on Craigslist, not eBay. Okay, there you yeah, go. So, so yeah, so. Because they've got, cla they're classy. Yeah, and they, they can just buy on, off the market uh, from Craigslist or go to the store and ask someone to jailbreak it for them. Okay. So it's a different, mar different segmentation. Right. Do you guys understand that? You guys are too young to know this, maybe. You guys don't know eBay anymore? Yeah. I, I'm not sure. Well, so we'll, 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 we're going to have to educate, <laughs> educate you on two things. One is there's eBay, which was an on, is an online marketplace. Still, ask your parents about eBay. The other thing was is iPhones used to come locked to the network. So if you got a phone that was locked to the, let's say, singular, this was a carrier back then, network, that phone could not be used on another network. You could not take it to Sprint. You could not take it to T-Mobile. In some cases, it wasn't just that they, soft, they, they programmatically locked it. It's that the components inside the iPhone did not work on a different network because they were using CDMA or they were using GSM. These are different standards, okay? So luckily, AT&T and yes. Singular were on the GSM network, right? That mm -hmm. technology, and that's what the rest of the world was on, yes. basically, right? Except for Korea at the time. And so you could get a AT&T phone, iPhone, right? Unlock it and the technology inside would still work in Hong Kong or yep. in China or wherever. Everywhere around the world as, as soon as they are on GSM network. So you made this discovery that someone would pay you $3,000 mm -hmm. to buy a $600 phone, mm -hmm. then do some magic to it so that they could use it and you would ship it to them. And how much, how big were your margins when you did well, that? Well, 600 and then in average, I sold it for more than uh, $2,500. So you, you do the math. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the, 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 the ticket that I, I sold so many, okay. I make 700,000 US dollars out of it. Yeah, so, okay. wait, wait, so, so let me just put it in this context. Each one of those phones is equivalent to the price of a credit here at Berkeley. 
So you would have to sell how many to pay for a semester? Well, I, I, I honestly forgot. I, I paid out of state tuitions, uh, like 20 something thousand at the end for, for, for one semester, something like that. Yep. Yeah. It's much more than that now. Okay. So anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a good investment, by the way, <laughs> just to say it. All right, so you were making a couple hundred thousand dollars on this particular clever hack that you found. Yeah, opportunity that I found. I yeah, I like it. <laughs> Marketing opportunity, it's yeah. not a hack. All right, so what did you do from there? Like, you were in class and you were also running this business. What did you do after that? Did you keep doing it and then why did you stop? Well, uh, so the iPhone business is one of the things that I kind of like dropped out of school to do it. But I, Apple was so smart. Uh, after a while, they find out all these Chinese guys, like me, going to the store, buy all this iPhone. Uh, because at the beginning, you can buy the iPhone from the store with cash. So, so they just cannot keep track with how many phones you have been buying. So as soon as you show up with cash, they have to sell it to you. Then later on, after like, like three to four months of time, they require anybody to buy an iPhone with a credit card. And then each credit card can buy a maximum of five iPhones. So I have been borrowing all my friends' I, I, credit card to do it. And then after that, I ran, ran out of credit cards. Um, and that's the point that you see the price on eBay. All this iPhone price got skyrocketed because no one can get the stock. But I found a trick from Safeway and Walmart. So we have this like American Express, Visa, Master, debit card, that, like gift card that you buy from the shelf. Sure. Yeah, so you went to buy Visa gift cards. Yeah. They, each of them have a unique like, credit card number. So you show up, that's unique. And then I, I guess I am one of the few that really found this trick at early stage. So there, was, there were a period of time, I guess, at least like a month of it. I'm the on, almost the like only one have stock on, to sell on eBay with an not iPhone. So I, 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 if at that time I can get like a, a container of iPhone, I can, I can sell it everywhere, Russia, China any country that you can name off. And how much more did you charge at that point when you were the monopoly on eBay? Well, you know, still, that, that, okay, it's the economic class, okay? That's a pawn that is exceed all this purchase, uh, what, what, what they call it, utility level? I, I, I yeah, the, the ML, <laughs> marginal re, uh, return, I, I forgot what's yeah. the term of it. it. It doesn't really use for when, when you are really running a company on those terms. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you hear that? Econ is useful, but not when you're running in a But a you company. know that. Based on the cost, you know that there's a pawn that people just, okay. Oh, I, I want it, but it's to a pawn that's too expensive, I just would buy a car. It's even more cooler than getting a phone, something like that, right? Okay, so, so at that time, I, I, I guess that's the period of time I made the most money. And then after that, I guess a lot of people find it, uh, that figured way, it out, figured it out right. and then much more way to unlock and jump your iPhone. Right. So, so yeah. the, the market literally died down within a year of time. Now, so uh, we, have some of, we have lots of students from around the world who yeah. are in this class, and some of them are from Brazil. And there's a word for what you just did, What's and that, that is jeitinho, <laughs> right? The Portuguese is called jeitinho. It, it means find the clever way. Okay, fine. Right, the little, the little way, right? Okay. Is there a word in Chinese for this, to find the clever, the clever way? Wow. And those who speak Chinese, is there a word for this? I, I can't think of one, okay. Ah. Uh, Maybe, I don't know, it's being smart. Because uh. we're gonna have to name it the Steven. Like that's, it, that's the move, is to find like that clever. Well, I, I would say, okay, solve your own problem. If there's a problem you want to solve it, just solve right. the problem. Yeah, that's right. the universe of solve the problem. <laughs> okay, well, we'll figure out what the Chinese word for that. All right, yeah. so, so that's how you got through college, was mm -hmm. to, to hack Apple's like, yep. clever ways of trying to stop you from doing that. What, what happened then? Did you, why did you stop doing this business? Well, after Apple really kind of, uh, first of all, it's really hard to get stock uh, without a contract anymore uh, at that time. I guess they changed a lot of policy, and then uh, at that time, I was busy on applying college and all that stuff. So, so we find the margin and it's so competitive. So that each phone that at the end, we're just making like 50 to $100. But the risk of running that business on losing one phone is so high, it's just not, 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 not good enough for us to, to do it. Because we, we lost some phone over the years, uh, over, over the months that we have been wanting it. We, I, I lost the most in Middle East and uh, uh, Service Asia. People are buying it. At, at the end, it's a scam. They, they charge back to PayPal. 
things like that. So, so uh, when the margin is high, we, we can tolerate that kind of loss. But when the margin for each phone is like 50 to 100, I would rather just sell it on, on Craigslist so that you can meet the person so that you know who are you selling for and they give you cash, it's even better. But uh, that takes a lot of time, it's not scalable. At the end, we just decide not to do it. Yeah. Okay, okay, so, so the, the mechanics of the business started to not make sense. Yeah. Okay, so then what happened? So now, uh, all, with all good like, opportunities, mm -hmm. they dry out, right, mm -hmm. at some point. So once that dried out, what, what did you do from there? Well, I made enough by that opportunity, and then I got accepted from Berkeley already. So I know that because why I was working so hard, a Chinese restaurant, selling stuff on eBay, unlocking iPhone, is because I don't have money to go to university, go to college here. Because I, I know even I got the offer from, from any school, I just have to wait for one year or two years to save enough money to go to school. So I, I, I guess uh, by the time that I know I, I passed through that safe net, for the next two years, I'm safe. I don't need to ask my, my, my parents, uh, and there's no way my parents support me on, on the living and, and studies here. Then mm -hmm. I guess kind of, at that time, I really started to focus here in, in, in Berkeley to, to try to enjoy the, 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 the campus life. But at, at the same time, I still work for a Chinese restaurant for at least three to four nights a week. Right. Yeah. Okay, so, but why? Why, why you're, you've got enough money and you're mm -hmm. at Berkeley, why did you stay working in the Chinese <laughs> restaurant? It's in interesting that you did that. Well, I think it's one of the opportunities that I, I found out it, it didn't last long. But working for a Chinese re restaurant, I know that every month I have stable income. That other than the tuition is being taken care of, then every month all my expense, uh, expense like gas for the car uh, uh, and then rental, uh, the rent. I, I rent an apartment with some of my friends in Amberfield. So I pay like 600 per month. So I, I still put a target, I need to make that money. And then all the money that I made from the iPhone have to be for school. So in case anything happened, that, that, that no one can touch my money that going to school, so that I can finish the school in two years. Great, yeah. so you are very disciplined in like this, I it's absolutely expensive. want expensive, I cannot afford more than two years. Yeah, there you go, there you go. So, so why did you choose Berkeley? Why Berkeley and you had other places you might have gone, why here? First of all, as a transfer student from uh, Lofton, California, I went to Diablo Valley College, and then uh, uh, UC system is one of the top transferred uh, 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 school that from my, my college, that's why I picked it. And then uh, the other reason is actually very stupid. By the time that my, my, my dad put me on the plane, come to, uh, came to uh, California, and then at the gate uh, in Hong Kong uh, airport, I told my dad, hey, I'm going to California, I'm going to the US to study. I'm going to study the best school, otherwise I'm not coming back. And you know why I said that? Because it's a one-way ticket. With 200 US in my pocket, that's no way to, for me to buy a return ticket without my own way. Right. So, uh, and, and at that time, the best school that I know is not Stanford. It's Berkeley, because Stanford is something that private school, come on, who goes to private school? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, so, uh, so I say, okay, uh, uh, Lofton, California, Berkeley is, is great. I heard, of, I heard of the name before, and then I, I, I said it to my dad, I'm going to Berkeley, even though my dad is doesn't know, okay, what's Berkeley? Uh, then then I, I said, okay, I said I really want to do it, and then I keep focusing on, on going to the business school here, and then even I was in uh, DVC in the college, I always work on all these ideas and, and extracurricular activities. I was one of the first international students to be a student government president for a community college for, in, in California. And actually I went to like, like the Congress to meet with some senator and congressman uh, uh, just because I want to get in here. So I, I guess that's kind of stupid reason why I really want to be here. So why did you choose what you chose to study? Well, business, I always think business school teach you how to do business. <laughs> <laughs> but I am not. So by the way, <laughs> he was a student in my class eight yeah. years ago. That class really there. teach you how to do business, honestly. <laughs> yeah, because in, 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 when we were a kid, you know, business school so cool. After graduating from business school, then the like MBA, all this thing that you can get to. Like at that time, I was I wanted to be a management consultant when I was in Haas. All right, because you, when before you get in, you try to research online. Okay, these people graduate from Berkeley, and I'm like CEO of this company, CEO of that company. It's so cool. But end up, you, you, you go into class and then find out actually it's learning theory. 
and, 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 and some of the materials that from, from, from the books. Right. Econ. You econ, learn so yeah. much econ. Yeah, so, so much econ. But that is very fun time that I learned econ because it was after financial crisis. Right. So learning how that all works. Yeah, yeah. actually putting all this theory in place that how to explain financial crisis is really, really fun. Uh, but don't, don't, don't Not unless don't you're invested it. in the market. I can tell you it wasn't fun. Don't, don't hope for another one. It's not a good time to, 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 to do that. But uh, so uh, why, work, uh, why business school is because I got a wrong signal and I have been doing business on and off when I was a kid. I help people to do DIY computer. Uh, I guess no one do it anymore except you are a gamer. Uh, so I think I really want to get myself into understanding more about business. That's why I really want to go into business right. school. Right. That's, uh, I guess before we really graduate, the reason that we want to get into good school is because it sounds cool. And then it, it seems like you get you a good job. I, I, I'm a Chinese, I have a Chinese parent. Get to a good school means everything to your parents. So a very famous school that your parents can tell your friend, their friends that they know, oh, that's good school. <laughs> <laughs> you all know this, right? You all live this. So, oh, so Stephen's going to be a doctor. In, yeah, Indians, OK. As soon as anything that, that, that for these two races, you know, yeah. So, OK, good. So that was a little too much truth, right? Um, <laughs> uh, right there. Uh, so how did you discover SCET. You knew it as CET. Uh, How did you discover our classes? So, honestly, I, I was just searching through the, the syllabus, and, and there was some friend talking about uh, having this project to, to, to start a company, something like that, uh, on the side, which I think is really cool. And then I found out this class actually helped you to do it by warning it with other uh, uh, stu uh, with uh, students from other major. And at that time, I always thinking, if I want to start my business, I need to work with people that not only accountants or, or, or like lawyer, legal stuff. You have to work with different type of people. And if you are in Haas, you get to know the same type of really social world, you know, whatever you, kind of people that really organize fraternity thing, is the business major people, right? But there's so many friends. I have a really good roommate. Uh, uh, they're also from Hong Kong. He's a uh, math major. Right. He just loves math. He helped me to figure out all the math class. Okay, so half fifty percent of the credit that I, I earn from math class is to be belongs to him. So yeah, but he loves numbers so much that even when I was working on accounting stuff, he keep looking at me. Okay, what's that number? It's like so annoying that kind of uh, uh, people. <laughs> but but you you get to uh, you get. This is the fun part of Berkeley. You get to know a lot of interesting people here. Yeah. And, and uh, I always want to work with more different type of people and uh, students. And then uh, your class, actually, we know that there will be a lot of engineering students mm -hmm. and then a lot of math and even physics. I guess we have some, someone from, from, from I, forgot, I forgot, some kind of like physics stuff that I, after like 10 minutes, I have no idea what he's talking about. It's like building a rocket or something. Uh, that kind of students uh, is really fascinating. And, and, and so you're cl I remember your team. You guys had a very aggressive, like, we're going to conquer the world. Do you remember the idea you guys were working on, the company you oh, guys yeah, built? Oh, yeah, it's called Mobi Food. Mo mobile Food? Mobi Food. Mobi Food. Mobi Food, yeah. Yes. Mobi and food. why don't you give them the elevator pitch? All right. Wow. OK, this is the fun part. I, I love doing this. All right. Imagine you are, oh, in a, <laughs> imagine you are sitting in a stadium in the Warriors uh, Staples Center, uh, not Staples Center, I love the Lakers, uh, uh, the Oracle Center, <laughs> Oracle Stadium, yeah, go Warriors. So, but you are so hungry. My wife is, is with me today, and you always go with friends. For a lot of people, they, they go to all these events with their wife and their kids. When they, are get, they get hungry, you are the one that love watching the game, you want to to see the three pointers, okay, the last seconds, how, uh, the buzzer beater, but your kids say, hey, Dad, I want a hot dog. And then you end up paying like some, a lot of people, seven hundred dollars for the ticket. You end up lining, lining up, just waiting for getting a hot dog or a pizza. How stupid is it? Imagine you have this mobile application, you just order it. We know exactly where you are sitting because you have the ticket number, right? Just input it, pay online, pay on the phone, and then you have your food delivered to your seat. Enjoy the game time with your kid. Something like that. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> that, that was like nine years ago. The fact that you remember that, that is insane. We spent so much time on that presentation, come on. <laughs> no. Actually, I, so I have, a, I have a printed copy of that presentation that he signed. 
Yeah. So that's something that we have as, as kind of a cherished artifact at SET. Uh, because they've worked really hard and you can see there's promise there, but it's a, it's a college project, right? <laughs> Compared to where he is now. And, and actually I wanna transition a little bit into, into discussing a bit about that. Um, well, actually a, a little bit more about your time in Berkeley. What, what was your favorite class? And I know mine is your favorite. So second yeah, yeah, favorite, yeah. your second favorite class. So how many business major students here? All right. So undergrad, that's a really famous marketing 106 by uh, uh, Robinson. No yes. one, no one, no. Okay, the 106 marketing from Haas undergrad. Robinson class. Okay, oh, the fat professor. <laughs> yeah. so, all right, anyway. You're so, old now. The professors have retired. While no, no, he's teaching. I guess maybe in summer class now. I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Dave, 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 uh, David Robinson. David Robinson. David Robinson, yeah. David I think Robinson. he's still here. Yeah. yeah. All right. I love his class because he's one of the most, the most mean teacher that <laughs> ever. You know, he grades you by if you ask questions or, or contribute in the class. All right, that's one of the participation. Oh, we do that too now. Ah, oh, yeah, good job. So, <laughs> so he created that when you raise your, question, you raise your hand and ask a question, if he think it's a stupid question, he will look at you like, without facial expression, and point another, okay, you. <laughs> so you don't even know, is that a good question or a bad question? So what, 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 what's that? So you really think very, very carefully for each of the chance that you can speak up. I'm gonna have to start doing that now. Because that's a good... Now you can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Different time of a professor. Thank you yeah, for giving me... Really yeah, right. Okay, so you like the marketing class. What, is the, what non-business course did you learn the most from that has positively, positively impacted your entrepreneurial journey? Might be something that's been a surprise. Well, there was one that... Uh, uh, not a class, but actually... Uh, the, the, the ex-federal chief, Yellen? Yeah. 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 Janet Yellen's class. Janet Yellen, yeah. Not, uh, not her class. I guess she, she just came back for, for one as a guest speaker or something for a class. I forgot what was that is. But that was the time that after the financial crisis. That class changed me. Uh, why? It's because we were under the financial crisis and everyone just trying to find out solutions or explanation why that happened. Honestly, until today, a lot of people have explanation on it. But why? That's... There's no right or wrong answer. All right. Yeah. So just so you, you guys are too young for this, yeah, but during so, that period, just so you know, there are kids who are in school that the next day they left because they couldn't afford being here. They, their, their families were wiped out, right? So uh, people had to leave their homes. It was, it was pretty traumatic. You guys were so young, you probably don't remember some of that stuff happening, but it had a pretty substantial impact on students here at the time. Yeah. And so, so uh, at that time, really, listening to expert and, and the discussion from the class to debate why that happened and, 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 and to look at the world from a different point of view because so many students from, from uh, a postdoctorate degree and things, they chip in their, their view from different countries. And then I found out we are here in California and then in the state that we are the epicenter of this financial crisis. We think it's so big that after everybody but actually, there's a, uh, some people from other countries that, yeah, it's not a big deal. Our, our, our economy is like shit anyway. So, so why, what kind of financial crisis we have like every day? Wow. So, so how we look at things is, is one of the, uh, what kind of ang angle that we identify a problem? How big is that problem? It's actually, it really depends on, on where you are right. and when, when, when you look at it. And I want to kind of highlight that because my generation, people think I'm, some people think I'm very young and I love those people, but I'm actually kind of old and, and I can't, I don't know what you guys will remember uh, about your college time, but for me it was 9-11. It took me a long time to graduate, right? So that was kind of in the middle of, of me um, going through my second tour of duty at Berkeley trying to finish. That had such a huge impact on the way that I viewed problems in the world and the th and my role in it, and it's for your generation. It was the 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 financial crisis that mm -hmm. changed. It sounds like changed the way that you saw yourself yeah. in that. 
right? Just that debate because so so many people just the whole auditorium is packed of people, and then everyone's trying to ask questions, and then the, the topic is just fascinating. Right. Yeah. So for you guys, it may be the political climate today, right? It could be something that will happen in the in geopolitical things in the next few few years, right? Some of you come from other countries where you're dealing with some of these political questions too. And that will have an impact on the direction that you go, even if you don't think about it now. It has, it's affected me, it's affected yeah, for him. Example, one of the things that for the last several days that I was in Washington DC, is it made in China good or bad? Do you want to have this Apple Watch? If it's made in China, you can buy it at the current price. If it's not, then expect the price will be like 20% or 30% higher for the next six months before someone figure out how to do it in other places. Right. So what is right and wrong? That, that's, that's no answer on that, just think of it. Right, right. And that debate is happening today, Yeah. right? If you look at, uh, what is it, Foxconn is opening up a multi-billion dollar factory in Wisconsin to hedge their bets that America may be just buy only American. It could, that could happen, right? So they're, they're trying to get ahead of it. So these are questions your generation is going to have to deal with. And I can tell you from both of our experiences, that has an impact on your career, what directions you go to, as well as the opportunities that are in front of you. Um, and so let's transition into that, right? Um, you now run a company called GoGo Van. Mm -hmm. You founded it with friends mm -hmm. back in Hong Kong. At when? You went back to Hong Kong after you graduated? Yeah. I, I was back to Hong Kong by the end of 2010, after the OPT period, OC. Yeah. Yeah, I have like three months to look for a job. After, if, if no job, then... They kick you out. Yeah, they kick you out. So I, 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 I'm done with that, and then I was back to Hong Kong in 2010, and then I, I still looking for a job. The first job that I interviewed was in Bloomberg in Hong Kong. They asked you how to sell, how to sell hi-fi to a deaf person or something like that, I forgot. So, so that was interesting, but I couldn't get any offer because I'm not that type of person that really good at interview. I just kind of, okay, you guys are going to look for a job. One of the worst moments that I have to, when you meet a manager, that you have to talk like you're the friend of manager. And then if you get a chance to, to, to interview with the partner, you need to find out what they like, and you will pretend that you are feeling in the culture, culture fit, okay, spend nine hours in the airport, is it right guys, things like that. I'm not, I don't like you, I don't like you. Why, why to, well, we are, we are human beings. So sometimes like, when you are going to interview, it's like, this guy is like talking about watch, okay? What's wrong with the watch? You know, just tell the time, okay? So, so it, I'm not that type of person, so that's why I couldn't get, 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 get any job. I'm terrible at interviews as well. Yeah. Because apparently I sound like yeah, I want to be, yeah. <laughs> apparently, yeah, apparently I sound like I want to, I'm interviewing them so that I'm going to become their boss. I, I've been told that after an interview, so I, I'm terrible at interviewing as well. So I started uh, a, a small company, like just one man band, trying to do some Kickstarter thing for charity. Imagine to help all this charity to use crowd. That sounded very Berkeley. Yeah, very Berkeley. So yeah. you wanted to crowdfund or crowdfund for <laughs> charity. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But end up that idea is not working in Hong Kong or Asia anyway, because most of the uh, uh, companies that are spending all, all this money on corporate social responsibility, the ROI they are going to get, they want to get, is PR. Just how many views, how many press releases I'm going to get by doing this. So right. that's really stupid, okay? Mm -hmm. Even the same KPMG or uh, PwC that they are right. running like all these uh, 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 CSR programs, here in California or in the United States, is very, very different from Asia. They don't do that. Right. So, so I, I tried to do that. I raised 100,000 Hong Kong angel funding, but after like six to seven, nine months, it's really hard sell uh, to any company to do it. I tried to sell, sell it to Cathay Pacific so that all the Asian miles, all these miles, uh, me, uh, uh, members under Cathay Pacific can use their miles to translate to some donation to some charity so that actually translate to a, like a good faith from the, from the company that, okay, if you cannot use your mile, which will, will expire, and a lot of people actually have their miles just expire. How about I just, okay, select 10%, 50%, or even all of it to some charity I like, and then you guys help. So, so things like that, but it didn't really work out. So after that, and then- how So how long did you try that experiment? 
Well, six to uh, more than six months. Okay. Yeah. And then what, how did you decide, you know what, I got to do something else? Because well, this is a difficult, many of them are in Challenge Lab in the <clears> class <throat> that you took, and they're facing a pivot. Okay. Right. So at what point did you say, okay, I've got to completely get out of this? Okay. That only apply on me. Okay. Don't, don't say to Ken that. That's what Steven said. All right. That only apply to me. So what happened is because, you know, I, I work in a Chinese restaurant and I went to DVC and then I have two very good friends called Lek and Weave also came from Hong Kong. We went to the same school, DVC, and worked for the same uh, Chinese restaurant as delivery guy for two years. And then they graduated by the end of 2011. By the time they came back to Hong Kong, they looked at me, hey Stephen, even you graduated from Berkeley, couldn't get a job here in Hong Kong. That's no way we get a job, because they graduated from UCLA and USC, oh, it's a good school. But <laughs> <laughs> they are the guys that uh, uh, we sold iPhone, sell automobile parts on eBay together. They, they are they're the partners uh, uh, since the beginning. Then they said, how about we, we do something else? Uh, uh, your, 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 your idea seems it's not taking off, uh, let's do something else. And then we said, okay, let's explore because it's kind of like the old games and, and, and I just love doing stuff with them. Oh, so, I see where this is going, okay. Yeah. So end up, because all of us are just like uh, delivery guys. Yeah, you guys are, it's the restaurant crew. It's the, the guys who all worked at a restaurant and yeah. then what's the idea that the restaurant crew came up with? Yeah, that was very, very stupid at the beginning, but end up, uh, it's stupid, it was stupid here, but it was a fan fantastic idea in Hong Kong. Is, uh, we were a delivery guy, right? So you guys buy like takeaway food from Chinese restaurant and the boss, the takeaway boss that you got is like paper box, sometimes have a metal, uh, metal carry on it. I guess it's, they, they don't have it anymore because it's the cost issue. They still have it, right? But on top of the box, it's like white box with some red printing on it. Have a light day or like, 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 like a tower or a dragon, okay? I don't think, I, there's no innovation on it, all right? That's been like that maybe for a lot of yeah. years. And then there was a period of time that the bosses is keep saying have a light day. On the plastic bag that you get, have a nice day, it's like a must, right? Other than that, there's no other design. Okay, have a nice day. So even the boss, it was written on like, have a nice day. And I'm a delivery guy. I just finished school and I'm here, I want a lunch, but I started to de do delivery. I look at the food, but I, I can't eat it. So it smells so good, but you just can't touch it. And then it keep telling you have a nice day. <laughs> so, so, so that was like, at that time we were, we really keep packing the boss into the plastic bag and then we would shout out in the restaurant, I don't think it have nice day. So, so, so just say out now so that the, the boss kind of hear it, so that they know we are hungry, so you just, we are mad, whatever, it's too busy. And then we also always pack these fortune cookies. That's all, like really American thing, fortune cookies. We, we don't see it in Hong Kong. Uh, or real, real Asia, okay? <laughs> So, anyway, when you pack it, uh, the fortune cookie inside, you know that some of them are broken. You just put it together, <laughs> pay it, and then slip the, 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 the fortune cookies, the, 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 the slip back into the fortune cookies, and then put it inside the, the, the bag, and then just go, right? And then there was, there was one time, very funny, there's a really good saying that fit the moment, okay, if you look at the bright side of the world, it will be, everything will be fine. Then you look at, I'm hungry, have a nice day. So, why don't you put that message on the boss, okay? Don't finish the Chinese food and then <laughs> fortune cookies. Oh yeah, it's a nice day. So things like that, just put it directly on the boss. Say, cut that shit. Uh, so, so save the time and then we said, okay, how about put advertisement on it? If super, some superhero movie is coming to town, I live in the host family. So if we order Chinese food, we would put all the bosses in the middle of the table and then you just put whatever portion that you would want in your plate, right? And then the boss stay in the middle of the table. And we, uh, my, my host family have nine grandkids. So they would come back every, uh, every week to have like a, a family dinner and all, always show up. If you have an advertisement on top of the bus, that would be the talking topic, the topic for the dinner for the whole night. That would be a great idea. And then we, we try to uh, talk about it. We think it's very, very interesting, but end up we were so busy on other stuff, so we didn't do it. But by the time Lick and Reef came back to Hong Kong, there was one, one day that we, we, we just sit in a cha chan tent, which is a Chinese restaurant in Hong Kong, ordering some, some lemon tea, like uh, uh, milk tea. And then we see a lot of people coming in, order, ordering takeaway food. And then we have this white styrofoam boxes with nothing on top. We said, how about we put a sticker on top of it? Let's try it out. We have three newspaper. 
people get new, free newspaper. It's just like all the newspaper that we get on in campus. They charge the advertisers wherever to survive, right? Why not like free, free lunch box or free takeaway box? So we did that, and then and then. So where did you get the advertisers? Well, just cold call them. So you said, okay, we're gonna put some advertising yeah. on these takeaway boxes, okay. and then you're like. Let's just call some people to see if they'll advertise. And, and how was that? What, how well, did that go? Uh, that's a kind of growth hacking technique. Okay, long story short. So we decided to do that, and it was right before uh, Mother's Day. And then we created our own ad called uh, Searching for a Mother. Searching for a Mother ad, that is kind of a classified post ad. When you open a uh, 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 newspaper. newspaper, there's so many classified posts you need to add here and there. We take that out and change all of them to message like searching for a mother working for 24 seven free. Know how to teach a kid, take care of kid, know how to cook, know how to do laundry, all that stuff, all this requirement on, on that classified post. And then with a phone number, it's connecting to our phone. So we create that and then we did uh, maybe 500 of them, that kind of advertisement on a bus, and then went to a uh, district that with a lot of advertising agency office around that, their office is all around that, those buildings. So it's, Hong Kong is very small. So we talked to those restaurants around those buildings and then said, hey, we have this uh, 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 advertiser put this ad and then want to distribute around this area. Can, can I give it to you for free? And then you, you just put it, your foot inside and then you distribute for us. And then some of them, uh, some of the restaurant owners said yes. And then uh, end up, only 500 of them. End up, we did receive some call from advertising agency. Is this some, a uh, new media that we can paste add on, and then, haha, we know that it's effective. Someone will read that. Okay, thing. so let's let's slow that part down. Mm -hmm. So many of you guys are trying to customer validate right now. So you guys prototyped your solution without an actual product, really. I mean, like there was nothing that you're selling. It was a fake ad. Yeah, if some, some people calling, it's like, yeah, we are the media company. Yeah, how, how can I help you? They will tell you what they need, and then ah, that's the next step. So that's an interesting growth hack. That was very good. That is classic. If you don't have a product yet, right, and you want to see is this a worthwhile time to build this thing, I'm going to spend the next three months building this thing and not getting paid for it, what evidence do I need to have to say this is a good use of time? And so that's the test that you did. Yeah. And so you started getting calls from media companies. Yes, because they own the customers that who can place ad and who make the decision is the advertising agency. So you should spend like 100,000 here, like, like 50,000 or, or I don't know, 1 million on TVC. Not a lot of companies, they, they ran it full with, with uh, uh, agency to do it because their marketing team is really just three people, four people. They cannot manage so many different channels. So that's why marketing agencies are around the world and they are so big for A's. Got it. So then you roll this out, right? Yeah. So you suddenly, like, this is a good idea. We're going to build this. Mm -hmm. Who built it? Your teammates, right? Built some of the, 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 the business. Like, did you have to create a website? Uh, no, no, like... no website. A lot of different Facebook page. Uh, so we just did that and they called and we said, uh, Okay, it's connected with my personal phone. I don't know, it's, it's like, like some, some advertising company that called, hey, we are selling insurance or something. We were like regularly, hi, uh, who is this? Something like that, all right? So and then, uh, I, I, I saw this boss, oh yeah, yeah, this, this we, we have a community name called Boss Ad, advertisement on a boss. So, so very, very straightforward, we can change the name later. Don't, don't, don't call up on the name, is it cool, all right? You can always change it. So, oh yeah, 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 what, what do you want? Things like that. And then, okay, <laughs> you are a media agency. Okay, you, I saw your bosses in, in, in uh, what, uh, Tai Ku Sing area is one of the uh, district, okay? District A, okay? Do you have this service also in District C? Oh, yeah, of course we do. Uh, wait, <laughs> wait, <but laughs> wait. Yeah. You're looking up where District C yeah, is. Okay, yeah, so what, 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 uh, 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 what else you need? And then, can you send us your rate card? Rate card. I have no idea what's rate card. I'm not actually not what wake up. Can I Google it? No. <laughs> so, so, so you're okay. literally learning the industry yeah. as you are working in it. Yes. So, uh, so just for those students who say, I'm not experienced in this industry, I don't know anything about it, take a note here. Your job is to learn. Otherwise, you are not an entrepreneur. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you can be learning on the job mm -hmm. because, frankly, no one's paying you. So <laughs> it's completely legitimate, right? Yeah. 
All right, so then you started building this thing, you started getting calls. How did you go from there to GoGo? -Go? What, what's the next step uh, towards GoGo? So, go -Go? end up, all this growth hacking really work, and then within nine months of time, we have only several restaurants in that district A using our buses to over all Hong Kong, over 600 restaurants. We're on our, our, our list. So that they will order the buses for us. So uh, we have that kind of great like, uh, uh, distributors or channels to, to distribute the buses. But uh, the thing is to get our buses to the restaurant is really, really difficult because most of them, they require uh, our logistic uh, delivery. Ah, so you, so you guys built these special boxes that have advertising on them. But then you had a second order problem, which is you had to deliver those boxes mm. to the restaurants so they can put the food in the boxes and deliver it, right? Mm. So how did you, and Hong Kong, have, how many of you been to Hong Kong? Oh, good, yeah. Yeah, have you ever been in a taxi in Hong Kong? It's like a life-affirming experience sometimes because both the traffic and the hills can be mm -hmm. a challenge, Yes. right? So how did, so you needed to get your boxes mm. to your, your partners, your customers. What happened? So um, at that time, we had a lot of call centers. It's just like old-fashioned, old uh, I'm not sure if you really understand it. Taxi company used to based on like radio frequency or some, some, some old technology yeah. to connect with uh, uh, the, the dispatch taxi. Right? So it worked similar in Hong Kong for all these van or, or truck drivers based on radio frequency. So we call all these call center to arrange a uh, vehicle for us to, to do delivery. But every day we have to wake up at like six in the morning and keep calling different call centers and they will help us to, to look for a vehicle. But you don't know how much time you spend on it, maybe like two hours, five hours, you never know, okay? Because they just, okay. It was like that. Hey, I need a van from A to B. Okay, they were like, okay, I helped you away away. Then you don't know when you are getting a call back. So, so you needed to de deliver these boxes and you would call up these vans and yes. say, hey, can, I need to deliver this thing. Like, yeah, I'll be over in a second. And then two hours later, yeah, you no haven't one show heard, up. no one shows or up. If someone shows up, it's like 10 of them. I don't need that much. And then at the end of the day, we're like, okay, I'm here anyway, pay. So, so we end up have a lot of that kind of experience. But anyway, that is the major problem that we need to solve the logistic problem. And then over the time that we, we, we did deliver the buses to different restaurants, we saved a huge list of drivers' numbers. And then we found out some of the drivers actually is on, on this, uh, using smartphone and on WhatsApp. So end up, we put all these drivers into different WhatsApp groups. But at that time, WhatsApp only had like 10 people in a group. Now it's like 50 or 100, it's okay. But back in the days, it's like 2012, 2013. So only 10. So we have so many different driver groups, and then the, the rules was very simple. Every morning, we would send out a message, the, the route information, A, B, C, D, E, 1, 4, 3, 4, 5, so uh, the, with the information, and then who respond to that message first? I want to do A, or I want to do B. That get the job, okay? That, make much, uh, that was much more efficient than those call center. But we have so many groups, so that someone from group five respond, and then actually group one also have respond, and then we have to pick. Okay, two drivers look for the same one, and then we said, we have to tell one of the drivers that, I'm sorry, there's another group of drivers took uh, uh, a route. So he would say, I don't know, I don't care. In my role, which is his WhatsApp group, I'm the first. I'm coming. So, so that happened all the time. So, but, and, so, wait, so let's, let's do the steps here. So you had a problem of trying to deliver boxes mm -hmm. on time and the existing solution that was available with calling these vans mm -hmm. inefficient and costly because they might not show up or they'll all show yes. up. So you built a, a solution to solve that secondary problem, mm -hmm. which was to use WhatsApp as a solution to manage the, the routes. Mm -hmm. And then that also created a third problem, which is you're starting to get multiple vans yeah. responding. It's a good problem to have to us. Yes. Yeah. So then what? Then we decided how we can solve this problem with no more like arguments, uh, drivers showing up and just kind of forcing us to right. raise the gas dollar or, or whatever money that they want. So I just want to make sure I understand. You have yet to build any piece of technology at this Nothing. point. Do you guys know, understand okay. that? They have yet to build a single piece of technology. They have been using, piecing together existing technology from WhatsApp to solve that problem, to calling, 
you know, these vans, those were the ways they were solving the problem of delivering their boxes. Mm -hmm. You had, you manufacture these boxes, yes. right? But that's in China or whatever. Yeah. But he has yet to build any app, any platform, any website. So for those of you guys who feel like you need to build a whole new product before you even talk to a customer, he has just proven that's not true, right? You have built a whole business without having to build any piece of technology. No, no, no technology right. at all. But now things are breaking, and now you're having to figure out how to build something. Yeah, and then at, at the end, we decided uh, this is a good industry that we can solve a, a problem with technology is by getting rid of the call center. Why it's so inefficient is because of the call centers being the middleman, and then each of the call centers have a limited number of drivers within it. So that's why we have to call a lot. And then we started to use WhatsApp, which only have 10 drivers together. Then end up, the model is quite similar to Uber. You have to find the closest drivers to you. But at, the time, at that time, we don't have Uber in Hong Kong, so we don't have that idea. But we started to think how we build a gigantic WhatsApp group for drivers. We thought about like e mailing lists, like emails, but most of the drivers even don't, don't even have a Google account, so, so I don't know how. So this is basically like a Slack channel yes, for uh, all the drivers yes, in, yes, in Hong yes, Kong. Yes, yeah or they can subscribe to it. And then we decide how about a mobile application uh, uh, for them to be, just get all the drivers yeah. together. Okay. And that, why we have that mobile application idea is honestly, 100% honest, because of this class that I took. <laughs> okay, so. Here's a movie food. Yeah. He took okay. my mobile class. So I was wondering how the connection so that. Yeah, because of that, because uh, uh, Lick and Weave, uh, two of them, they, they don't have any kind of this kind of experience at all. But I, I get to, to, to kind of test it out here, and then actually we can build a, a prototype within a, a semester time. Uh, so, so, so that really ignites us on, on, on just doing a mobile, mobile application. But building a mobile application in Hong Kong is like really like really advanced thing. Not many students or, or people really learning that or, or start doing it at that, that time. Right, so, so how, when did you decide to go from doing the boxes to just focusing 100% on um, GoGo -Go Van, the platform to help with mm -hmm. vans. So I built all this WhatsApp group, and then I have all these driver informations, and then I got, I got my first customers that really want this network of drivers. So how did that happen? Like, oh, how that, did you that, find... That's but just luck. That customer was my dad. Okay, you guys. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's a very, very quick uh, uh, story here. My dad is a construction worker. So he, he do remodeling for houses, uh, 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 for, 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 for people, like small houses, okay. So um, every day, he would transport all his equipment, like, like a ladder or like a chainsaw or something like that, to different places to work. So because we don't have a uh, vehicle, uh, and most of my, my father's friends, they don't have a vehicle because they, it's so expensive, and the parking, all this stuff add on, is so expensive to own a vehicle, so they always call this call center to get a van or try to move this equipment around the city. And then end up, I found out my, my dad, every morning, uh, he would go to, to this uh, 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 dim sum place around our houses. Uh -huh. uh, uh, that with my mom, uh, every, every morning, 7 a.m., sharp. He would go there for dim sum, but sometimes he stayed there for one hour, sometimes for two hours, sometimes for even lo longer. But in between, when I was a kid, he just keep making phone calls or using his old pages to, to, to connect to people. And then I found out when I have all this WhatsApp group, then my, 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 I found out my dad was actually contacting, contacting a lot of drivers. As soon as he finds a driver to pick him up for all this equipment, then he will leave the restaurant. That's why he keep reading newspaper, because he was waiting for someone to call back, that I can come to pick you up. And then I told my dad, hey, you don't call all these guys. First, first person that you call, me, okay? I help you to send message to all these drivers, okay? It's easy, okay? I just copy and paste. Then end up, my dad found out it's faster for me to get, a, get him a driver with a van than all this call center. Then he started to share this information with all his friends that who are all construction workers. And then in the Chinese, Chinese thing, if he is your dad's friend, he call you like, 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 like some relative, relative, it's like uncle. You call him uncle. So everyone is like to you, it's like uncle. It's like you, you have to do something for him. So, and then, and then my phone started to ring a lot. So first you were trying to solve your own problem yes. for your own business. And then you started, your dad's like, hey, can you help me fix my yes. problem with the solution you've come up with? And then all of his poker buddies are calling you. 
hey, can you fix my problem too with the solution? Oh, my, 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 my dad is just like, oh, my, my son can get a drive up really fast, okay, call him. So, something like that, he, 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 he didn't know anything that what I'm trying to do there. So he was just pimping you out. He didn't yeah, know yeah. that you- Oh yeah, my son can help. Yeah, no problem, no problem. <laughs> so when did they find out you, they had to pay you to do that? Oh, they didn't pay, it was free. So uh, it was taking okay. so much of my time and my phone kept ringing. And then Lake and with so my partners always say, hey, we have all these bosses to, to, to put a sticker on it to deliver. What kind of girls that you are dating keep calling you? So no, I'm, I'm trying to send a message to get a driver for my dad's friend. And then we started to debate why they, they, they need that and things. It's, we, then the idea started to get. So, so then you had to sit down and say, wait, we're getting a lot of opportunity over here. This right? demand. Yeah, this customers. demand over here for this thing that isn't even our product. Mm. When did you guys decide, wait, we should stop doing all of this stuff that's generating revenue uh. and we should focus 100% on this? Because that's the birth, really, of Go Go Van yes. is when you commit to doing that 100%. So how did that happen? First of all, selling lunch buses is not a good job, okay? The revenue that we got is like 200 US per month as a salary that we got back home uh, after nine months of working. And I have to put my mom uh, 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 to help out some time over the weekend. So it's not really nice. So that was like 1 20th of an iPhone that you were selling in the US. Yes, so each of the buses that we, 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 we distribute, we only make 50 cent Hong Kong, not even like, 10 cent here, yeah. not even 10 cent, it's, it's a simple penny. So, so from that, and then we, we studied the, 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 all these call centers, how many call centers out there, and then we found out a lot of call centers are actually making good money by charging the drivers to pay a monthly subscription. Ah. So, so if we can be one of the middle level or, 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 or kind of medium player in the field, then we can make like 100,000 Hong Kong per month, that's good. So, right. so compared to what we are doing. So we decide, okay, let's try to figure out that. Okay, in the morning, we still sell bosses, right. but not scaling up because we just can't afford to scale up. Right. In the afternoon, less because we have three of us. And at least two or one of us start to explore, talk to drivers to find out this uh, opportunity. So you did a business, so this is where the Haas part comes in, right? Which is you did an analysis of mm -hmm. what the growth potential would mm -hmm. be and the cost of that growth in your original business. Yes. And you said, this may not scale. But you saw that there was possibly, in the analysis, a lot of revenue that you could get from this new business. OK, so now you're building stuff and you're just doing the stuff. Tell us, because we have a little bit of time, about five minutes, how did you turn this into a billion dollar exit? Well, uh, not exit, I just merged it with another company uh, so that we, uh, it was a merger. Uh, we haven't sold the company yet. but. From there, we started to generate a lot of interest from the demand side. We have more and more people calling us because the way that we are getting vehicles is much faster than the traditional way. In a Silicon Valley term, the, the, the result that we are getting, the efficiency that we are getting is 10x over the old ways. So, so that's- So then it's more reliable when they say they're gonna reliable, show up. Well, at the, well, the reliable concept at the beginning is like, at least within like five minutes or 10 minutes, I have a call from my drivers that the driver said, I'm coming. Sometimes you call, use this call center, you can wait for one hour without anyone, anybody calling you. So that's the first step. So it's 10x better than, than the traditional way. So that first step, and then uh, over, the, uh, over the next few months, we talked to a lot of drivers. We find out most of the drivers hate these call centers. They need to pay a monthly subscription, as I said, but there's no business guarantee. Mm. Yeah. Then we, we, we think, okay, you can keep on doing whatever you like to do on radio frequency, pay the rent, pay the subscription fee, but if you have a smartphone, you can use our platform to get some little bonus or, or extra work, okay, in between. So it's another alternative for you to... For the so the existing, player. the incumbent player mm -hmm. has a terrible revenue model where they're charging these vans, even if they don't give them any business, they're charging them every well, month. Well, I don't think it would be terrible, but for the call center, it's great. Well, it's terrible. Yeah. Well, th that's the opportunity. It's terrible for the, the, the drivers. The drivers. Yeah. So that was an opportunity for you to provide a better deal yes. to the drivers. It's easy to poach them yes. because they don't feel like they're being treated well. Yeah. That's a lesson. There are plenty of markets out there where customers do not feel like they're being treated well because they have a they have to deal with a monopoly, right? And that's effectively, these are monopolies, yeah. right? And let those group of users or customers 
try it out. As soon as they try it, actually it's better than whatever I'm paying. Then they would tell you how you improve. Right, yeah. right. So, okay, so you did that. Now you said, yeah, look, you guys merged with this other company, but the valuation of that merger put you guys at a mm. billion dollars, yeah. right? And that, that's a pretty big deal to be valued at that amount. Mm. What is, of course, your, your negotiation skills probably factored in, but why did they cite they, why they believed you were worth a billion dollars? Well, first of all, we are getting a lot of questions. Of, um, my company has been around for five years, and uh, we are the most cost efficient startup in this field among all these players in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, we did not raise the most money, but the traction and then each customer that we get, we are, we are the, the most. So, so to a lot of uh, investor point of view, we know how to use or leverage capital. Yeah. And then at the same time, our, our team is relatively small compared to other competitors. So, so that, that, that was a time that we, uh, so a team, the team is just so attractive to most investor that what, what's wrong with these guys? How, how can they do it with, with that amount of people? Right? Right. And then we still want a call center. And then most of our, our competitors are like, oh, everything is on email, but we still pick up calls, but end up our business is really uh, uh, getting a lot of traction and customers, wherever they return, we have the highest grade. Yeah. Okay. So that is the, the basic. And then by the time that we expand our business to, uh, from Hong Kong to Singapore, to Taiwan, South Korea, and then uh, to X cities in China, then among all these places, we managed to use a very, very little uh, capital right. to get the traction over How there. many vans do you guys ma manage today or, or yeah. serve, serve? Well, we have over 8 million drivers registered on our platform. 8 million? Yeah, registered. They don't spend all the time on it they, because drivers, okay, today they work on it, something like this. Yeah, so, so yeah. So but. 8 million from zero. Well, to you, you were the only client. Yeah. You were the client to be supporting 8 million drivers. And hopefully, it sounds like you guys are providing service that, that they weren't getting before. You well, know, you're helping yeah, them for out. For both customers and, and the drivers, it's something new to them. Uh, thanks to all this DD thing, Uber thing, um, they help educate the market, not only in Hong Kong or Southeast Asia, but also in China. That really helped the drivers. Because our drivers are very different from all these DD or taxi drivers. The education time is much, much longer. There are, they, a lot of them in China, they ha haven't even educated, okay? They, they can't read. So they don't know, uh, smartphone, mobile app, what, what's that? Yeah. So, I've been in a yeah. taxi in China where I tried to do the whole translation thing to show the Chinese characters of where I wanted to go. He couldn't even read that yeah, because he, he was, he was uh, So try to so, educate them to, to okay. Yeah. It's like taking a kid to university to teach them an app. Right. So, so thanks to that, and then a lot of drivers now know how to use an app, but without reading right. character. Right. Amazing. Uh, so so that, that's how we, we kind of uh, uh, serve the, the customer by learning right. over the years, and we have localized product right. in different different right. countries. So you're at that size. I want to point out everyone the picture here because we're, I, I think we're going to go to questions, right? Is that, uh, look at this picture. A year ago, I went to see uh, Stephen in Hong Kong to give him our first uh, SEET award. We call it a barracorn. So that's why there's a horn <laughs> on the top of that bear. And it is our first barracorn, a student who's taken our courses, who've gone on to do something spectacular, and, um, and that was awesome to be able to give him that. So we're hoping, we actually have another Barracorn that just emerged recently. Hopefully you'll, you'll be the one handing mm. him a Barracorn, but we hope all of you uh, go on to do the same things that uh, Stephen has done. He did it eight years since he was in my class. You all have eight years now <laughs> from this point. We'll give you to right now. Almost 10 years, actually. It was yeah. 2009, right? Yeah, yeah, it was 2009, 2009 I think, yeah. 2009, nine. yeah. Yes, right. yes. Give you a little bit more time. Yeah, so nine years. Yeah, no, no, by the time you sold it was 2017. Yeah, last year, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it is, eight, it is eight years. You get eight years, right? Uh, but we'll give you a little, ex in, with, with inflation, it has to be actually $1.2 billion. <laughs> so, um, Absolutely. Yeah, thank you.
Um, we have about five minutes for questions. Um, so we want to start actually all the way over there. And then um, I know, too, that you can stay a little bit. But yeah. what we do is right at 8, um, a little bit before 8, we post a link for people to give feedback. Mm -hmm. And slowly people will come down. Okay. And so we've got five minutes, so get going. Hi there, my name's Saniha, and just like you, I'm a junior transfer from Diablo Valley College. So I have a two-part question. Why did you choose community college, and are there any advantages that you think DVC gave you over your peers who may have chosen a more traditional route? Well, why community college? Okay, the honest feedback to you is cheap. True. <laughs> yeah, I just can't afford it, and, 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 and uh, that's no, I, I didn't take any SAT. And my TOEFL at that time, I don't think any university would look, look at it because my English was so bad. Uh, I, I started from community, before I got in community college, actually I have to take this ESL class, English as a second language class, so that I spent like almost four months there before I really got into DVC. So that's the path that I, I, I took. But how it impacted me is, uh, I, I guess I, before I came to Berkeley, I get myself prepared for American type of education. First, in Hong Kong, we were, we, we were taught to, to just listen. Okay, you, 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 you have to be a good student in class, okay? You know, it's very interesting that in, in class, in Hong Kong or Asia, if teacher asks questions, okay? Anybody have questions? No one raise their hand. The guy that raised their hand, Again, so, so, <laughs> so you know that that guy will ask the questions, but no, no it's, everyone's so shy. But here in America, when people really have questions, they, they ask, no matter how stupid it is, okay, come on, I have a question. You don't have a question, you don't have a question. That doesn't mean that you understand 100%. It's just you don't have questions. So, so that's something that I need to adjust myself. That's something I learned from, from community college. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Melissa and I'm a senior majoring in business. Thank you so much for coming here. I'm an international student too and I know how it feels to like recruiting and stuff. It's hard, uh, people won't choose you. And then, so I'm thinking to go back to Indonesia next year when, after I graduate. Um, I just wanna ask, uh, you know like after graduating you go back to Hong Kong and then uh, companies won't hire you and then how did it feel and then what your parents think about it, and then how did you keep your spirit up so you can be where you are now? Thank you. Well, you know, it's really depressing when you want to talk to a lot of, okay, I, my wife is here, but I, let me put it this way. It's like you are dating a lot of girls and everyone say no. What's wrong with me? Okay, <laughs> Look, what's wrong with me? But, but at, at the same time, it's like, uh, you just need to stay in the game. Just stay in the game because you're like, okay, I'm done. You're done for life. So, 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 so don't, don't get, uh, have that get into your mind. It's like you have this attitude. I'm not sure, yeah, I don't care about what they look at me. I'm going to do whatever I, I'm the best in. If I'm not good at this, I learn, okay? If these two months I can't do it, have set a target for yourself. Next month, okay? After 20 interview, I have to answer that question why I want to work in this company better. <laughs> Okay, and each time you need to interview with different companies, you have to tell that story again, and there are different companies. It's a training, yeah. Without a lot of information, all the information you get, I, I bet, I guarantee you, you guys just Google it, how is it like, okay? But it's very different from working inside the company. But you have to answer that question. Only training can give you that, that attitude. And then, I guess one of the uh, great things that I got into Berkeley is the, 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 the the experience that I applied to so many universities because I was so worried that I couldn't get into any of it. So I just as soon as I know that they accept international students or without SAT score, I just apply. So I have written so many college applications and then just keep trying. It's kind of a fact that I, I, I guess I learned over the years. So that's the first thing that facing all this saying no thing. Yeah, if someone say, said no to you, to you, move on. So many companies out there. Right? And then the second question is, okay, how you deal with your parents? It's like, <laughs> it really depends on your parents. Uh, for my parents, it's like, every day they keep asking the same question, what are you doing today? Okay, why don't you get a job? Like, 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 like your cousin, like HSBC seems good. They don't, she doesn't have a nice degree, but 20,000 salary a month. 
Good, right? Why, why, why you hang out? I can take off myself. That's my answer. <laughs> no, that's, I'm sure everyone has had that conversation with their parents on some yeah, level. So, so that we need to spend time on it, yeah. Thank you. There's one question here. Okay. There you go. Hi, uh, my name is Henry. Um, like yourself, I, I grew up in Hong Kong. I'm an international student here studying engineering physics. Um, this is a question for both of you. Um, it's something that I've been sort of struggling with the past couple months. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room, their end goal is, is to become an entrepreneur or, or run their own business. But a lot of people say or tell us that right after college, it's good to find a job or um, get some experience working in an industry. Who are they? Those people tell you to find a job? Who are they? <laughs> Sorry, oh, well, I mean... Uh... Let's start with elimination, okay? Uh, uh, multiple questions. Who are they? Just cross them out first. Yeah, you, you list out the people who are telling you yeah, this Yeah, who, who are they? Oh, um, uh, I guess my peers, they, they tell me like you have to go into... The, the traditional way is to go into an industry under a big company and then start your own company. Um, so your peers are also students? They yes. have to get a job to uh, tell you to work for a company? Yeah. yeah. But there's also... <laughs> There are also other people who've like entered industry who also tell me that. Mm. So my, my ultimate question is, what do you have to say about someone who, who, whose end goal is to start their own company? Do you think it's better to, to recruit, work under someone else, or um, I guess just go into that right after college? Um, for me, if you want to be an entrepreneur, the only requirement is you are willing to learn. That's the, the only one, okay? I, I think uh, I've never worked on a full-time job because everyone said no to me. So, whatever. Uh, <laughs> then, then, well, Mind uh, you, he sold a billion dollar company so he can do that now. <laughs> so I just no. sit. <laughs> so you, I, I did interview. I did interview and I, I tried my best. I, even today, I think I tried my best, but just my personality, I don't fit in that interview process. All right? So, I'm not saying no to that role, I tried, but at the same time, I'm finding alternative way so that I can survive. I'm not saying that I want to be rich, I want to survive. I want to learn to survive. I'm not saying that I want to learn to be an entrepreneur, I want to survive, that's it, all right? But end up, if that is the path that leading you to start your business, doing your own thing, then end up can be an entrepreneur, that's great. If you find your path that you want to learn, end up, to be a scientist, that's also fantastic. To be a singer, fantastic, all right? To be someone that can build a rocket, help human race to get to another planet, fantastic. I'm not saying that you have to follow whatever people telling you what's the right thing. Why, so, yeah. So, so I, maybe, I get this question a lot. I, as you can imagine, since I teach students not only here, but in, in other countries. And, and you're asking the question of if, your end goal is to be an entrepreneur. Uh, what should you be doing? Listening to these people or, or taking another path? If you want to end up being an entrepreneur, the only way to do that is to practice being one now. Like, that's what he was doing in college, right? Those, those, the way that he was hustling with the iPhones and eBay and all of that is he was practicing these skills of looking for opportunities and then taking action when he saw them. That he was practicing that. Every time he saw an opportunity, oh, I want to go to Berkeley, here's the opportunity to get into Berkeley, he jumped at it. He's like, oh, I can make money off of eBay, I see that, he jumped at it. I can make money off of iPhone, he jumped at it. So it's that, seeing the opportunity and then acting on it. And, and that education, that learning part, that's what that is. Yo, I learned something new and I'm going to act on it. So if you wait and you say, I need more formal education, it's say, let's work at a bank or a consulting firm. What you end up practicing is being a banker or a consultant. And so you have to be very careful if you want to end up being an entrepreneur, that you do not narrow your learning curve by putting yourself in a bank or a consulting firm that has no interest in turning you into an entrepreneur, right? So you're, you're going to have to you, you want them to listen to other people, but you definitely want to practice this entrepreneurial stuff now. Mm -hmm. And that's why these classes exist, right? These clubs, these, uh, these events, these hackathons, they're all there so that you can practice 
this ability to look at an opportunity and then act on it. Thank you very much. Maybe last piece of advice, because it's kind of synchronized with some of the questions. Last piece of advice as a student, make yourself very, very poor. Because I, 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 honestly, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. I just want to survive. I need to pay for school, I need to pay for food, I need to pay for gas, whatever, I need to pay for it, okay? If you want to buy the newest iPhone, newest laptop, find your own way to buy it. That's the first practice. Don't ask your parents to buy it for you. That's not fun. <laughs> Keep their, okay, how to handle your parents? Keep their mouth shut by taking care of yourself. I don't ask you, you to, to buy me a laptop. I, I can take care of myself. I want that. You want a laptop, I can buy it for you. That's where you can keep your, your, your parents' mouth shut. It's like, okay, I, I don't bother you. <laughs> honestly, honestly. Uh, uh, what? Yeah, if they buy something for you, they seem to think they have the right to tell you what to do. Yeah. Right? It's an investment it's in your future, right? Uh, I just want to thank you for being Thank so you. Honest.